Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, I want to talk to you about the bull case for Rocket Lab and why this company might be the next super growth company and potentially even a hundred bagger if you're able to hold it uh, long enough for maybe 20, 30 years. Uh, this is a very, very surprising company. So I wanted to make a video that details my thoughts about the company and what I found out about this company up to now. So I have been listening to this book that you see here on the screen, uh, Ashley Vance, uh, When the Heavens Went on Sale. Ashley Vance was the first guy who wrote Elon Musk uh, biography a few years ago before the Walter Isaacson uh, biography. And in this book, he seems to continue the work that he started with Elon Musk and goes deeper into the aftermath of uh, and the significance of the SpaceX uh, private launch and what happened with the private space industry after. And if you are interested in investing into new age space companies, this is definitely the book for you to read. Also, if you're thinking about investing into Lockheed Martin and Boeing, Boeing, this is also definitely the book to read so that you don't make that mistake. Okay. Uh, so, and this book follows, uh, I believe, four companies, and one of them is Rocket Lab, and follows the company from, or tells the story of the company from inception to 2022 or something like that. Super effing interesting. I'm fucking blown away. This company, Rocket Lab, should not exist, okay? Uh, the uh, founder of the company is this guy that you see here, Peter Beck. He is a dishwasher engineer or was a dishwasher engineer with no university degree. Okay. And he decided to do a rocket company in a country that has many interesting things not going for it. So the country had New Zealand, no aerospace industry to speak of. So that meant that he had no talent pool that he could, uh, he could pull from no supply chains that he could, uh, pull from. Uh, and on top of it, uh, venture capital is non-existent in New Zealand. So he had no access to funding and US companies didn't want to invest into a weird New Zealand company because they had rocket companies to invest into the US. So he had no access to talent, no access to funding and no access to the parts that he needs. But other than that, he had everything going for him. Okay. He had his uh, good old fashioned problem solving and, um, he had his good old fashioned work ethic and, you know, working late. And seriously, everybody who met with this company, they thought he was a joke. Even I, when I first saw this company, I thought they were a joke and they freaking made it. They are the second company after SpaceX private company that managed to uh, launch a vehicle to space and they are I think that they launch more small rockets than, uh, I mean, SpaceX went out of this business. So they launch more small rockets than all of their competitors combined and then times like 30. Uh, so they have really, really made it very, very interesting company. And again, what they pulled off is unbelievable. Oh yeah. And I forgot to mention. So, and on top of it, he was not a millionaire like Musk and like Bezos so that he could, you know, invest his millions into this company. And he had no business experience before he started uh, this rocket company. So yeah, he had everything going against him. So now why is it possible that suddenly we have this new space age? Again, this became clear after reading this uh, book by Ashley Vance. And imagine this. The old space industry was, you know, government regulated and every time there was a mistake, uh, they just made new regulations and new safety precautions. And it got to the point that anything that you wanted to source for a rocket or for anything space related, it had to be from a certified aerospace company and it had, uh, you know, a lot of pre-made specifications. And that made it very costly because you could only buy from a few companies and what SpaceX uh, rocket lab and you know all the other uh, rocket companies realized is that this industry's got you know stuck in the past and consumer electronics like off the off the shelf 
consumer electronics became so advanced that they by themselves could maybe withstand uh, space and you didn't need all this uh, space certified um, you know aerospace uh, stuff and this is what SpaceX showed with their rocket launch that it could be done and this is basically what unlocked venture capital into uh, space and this is what unlocked that even Rocket Lab can exist on this, uh, on this uh, planet. So, and basically when you can use off the part shelves that are not certified for the aerospace uh, industry, famous examples, uh, you know, from Walter Isaacson's book, Elon Musk asked like, we need a cooling system from the Falcon 9. What does the, the rocket one cost? The one that is made for rockets, 200,000. He was like, F that. How much is it, does it cost to, you know, have a, a house cool down? And then somebody answered 5,000. He's like, good, go to the store, buy a, uh, buy a cooler for a house and then modify it so that it fits the rocket. So then instead of 200,000, they ended up paying 5,000 and plus a little bit of work cost. And there is a lot of this in the modern space industry. Then the second thing, which unlocks a lot of business for the space industry is satellites. So the old satellites, they were very, very big, basically, you know, car or bus sized uh, entities uh, that had to be shot up to space and they cost billions of dollars and they had to operate for you know 20 years so there there was no room for error so what happened is you started designing it had to go through a lot of co uh, committees and then it took you three years to design the thing and then you know you had to wait for a very expensive rocket for another two years and then by the time the satellite was up in space and in orbit, it was already outdated because there was new and better technology. So instead, uh, what a lot of startups realized is you can make these small CubeSats uh, that are shoebox size, which can go on very small rockets and they don't have to be in geostationary orbit, which is you have Earth here and then the geostationary orbit is a very far orbit. Uh, that basically makes it so that as the Earth rotates, the satellite is always on the same spot and it covers a lot of area on, uh, on Earth. And they said instead you could, you know, cram a hundred shoebox size uh, satellites into a rocket, shoot them up, and then it takes no time. Instead of billions of dollars, it costs you, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars. So like a hundred X drop in costs. And because the satellites are in low earth orbit uh, that means that you need a lot more of them and they only operate for three four years so and then you have to deorbit them they burn up and then you have to replenish your constellation with new satellites but you can always keep it up to date so you have something that costs you less it's much easier to maintain and it's much easier to keep up to date but if you truly understand this this also unlocks uh, the low Earth orbit to a lot of new innovation and a lot of new constellations and you know Samsung wants to do a constellation Apple wants to do a constellation and these constellations and there's many other companies they have to be shot up to space they have to be up capped and they have to so basically they need a crap ton of these small rockets that go up and down uh, ferrying all these satellites so in this new space age I'm sorry, I have to take a phone call. So I'm back. Uh, sorry, I had to take this phone call and it's 11 something and I'm not going to retake this video just because of the phone call and I somehow hit the pause button. So I'm able to just recontinue the video from where I was. The problem is I just don't remember exactly where I was. So I hope I made this point about the new space age, how uh, basically with these new satellites you need you have an, an almost unlimited limit unlimited um, amount of small rockets that you need to send up and it's not just that you send up the satellites and then they're up but it's like you constantly need to replenish the satellites so you need uh, a lot of them 
Uh, and SpaceX is basically not really competing in this field because they're so focused on going to Mars and small rockets don't take you to Mars. And uh, this is also why they don't have the Falcon 1 anymore. Uh, and currently Rocket Lab is really the only company that can, that can uh, do this small satellite launches. And they're very experienced and very good at it, very good pricing. But the rocket launch is not even really the best business. Um, they actually, you think of Rocket Lab as a rocket company, but they have been acquiring space services companies and actually already now 60% of their revenue comes from space services. For example, like making satellites, making um, different parts of satellites and, you know, writing software and upkeeping satellites and running satellites uh, missions. And this is what I'm super bullish on because, for example, you take SpaceX and that company was valued a few billion dollars just on the rocket launch. By the way, Rocket Lab is valued less than it's two point two billion dollars today, something like that. Uh, so SpaceX was valued at a few billion dollars and then they came up with the idea of Starlink. And Starlink added a hundred billion dollars of valuation to SpaceX. Maybe my numbers are a little bit off. Maybe SpaceX was 20 billion and you know Starlink only added 80 billion, but it's in this ballpark, okay? And I think that Rocket Lab is also going to come up with a similar opportunity. I don't think it's going to be planet-wide internet, uh, but it can be, I don't know what it is. If I would know, <laughs> it would be different or if they would know, it would be already announced. But I do believe that such a business model is going to come in place that is going to be a lot more significant uh, than the rocket launch. And they are the company that is best suited for this. And I'm not so worried about competition from SpaceX because they are their sole mission is colonizing Mars and they are not looking at um, you know, helping NASA design satellites. Uh, they're not looking at helping other companies, uh, you know, operate constellations. And Rocket Lab has already been chosen for outer space missions by NASA and has already been chosen for a, a lot of things. So they are very, very well positioned for it. And the best thing is that this new space era is just beginning and the opportunities are just now opening up. And when I mean just now, I mean Rocket Lab launched in like 2017 or 18 was when they first launched their uh, lock, uh, electron uh, rocket. And you know, these cube satellites are also very, very new. So we don't even know what the possibilities or what new business ideas or what new opportunities are going to um, come up. And this is why I think that this company is super exciting. Uh, this is not an exact valuation in this video because the thing is that this is a, a very risky uh, investment. They are very much in the beginning and I am a true believer. I read Chris Meyer's uh, 100 beggars in, in the stock market and the thing is, you know, Amazon was a bookstore company in the beginning and there was no DCF, no valuation that would have got you, would have gotten that bookstore to what Amazon is today. So basically it was impossible to see what that company would become. And he even calls it like not a black swan, but like a white swan event that, you know, you get super lucky and everything goes your way as a company and you just cannot model for that. And I definitely think that this company is so young and the rocket lab of 10 years from now is going to be almost unrecognizable from the rocket lab that is today. It's going to be a very different business model and it's going to be way more advanced and way more profitable than it is today. So therefore it's very hard to model it. I did do a valuation in another video that you can check and you can also ask me in the comments to make another video about it. Uh, this video was more meant to give you my bull thesis and why I'm so bullish uh, about that company. So to recap, you have a CEO that has already pulled off the impossible. And yes, I'm going to say it. His job was actually tougher than what Musk went through because he just had more odds uh, against him. So you have that going for the company. Uh, they are the only ones that have these small rockets in a very new industry that is just now blossoming and you know coming of age 
and they are grabbing possibilities of this, you know, space services, which is also a very growing industry. And we don't know what that is going to lead us to. And this is for the next 10, 20, 30 years is going to be with us, if not the next 100 or 200 years. Who knows? So I'm very, very bullish about this company. It's an awesome company. And I really recommend that you look at this company, do your own due diligence on it. And listen to or read this book by Ashley Vance. Um, fantastic freaking book. And thank you so much for listening. I'll see you in the next video. Ciao, ciao.